Hi there, and a very warm welcome to this IDC webcast sponsored by Workday, which is all about creating tomorrow's leaders in investment management through holistic digital transformation. Quite a mouthful, uh, but it, we've got a lot of exciting ground to cover uh, today, and I look forward to sharing some of our insights as part of that discussion. My name is Philip Carter. I'm the Chief Analyst for IDC in Europe, uh, but more importantly, I'm joined by two marvelous co-pilots for today's session. Uh, so I'm going to get them to introduce themselves. First of all, I'm going to go across to Virin Patel. Uh, Virin, how are you doing? I'm well, thanks, uh, Phil. So I'm Workday's Financial Services Industry Advisor for EMEA and APJ and uh, sat here in uh, cold and uh, rainy London, uh, but glad to be on this uh, conversation with you and both. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for joining us. If the, I'm in Munich today. The sun is shining, so a bit of weather showing off there. Uh, what's it like in Denmark, Bo? Hi, Phil. Hi, Varen. Uh, yeah, Denmark is actually stormy Denmark today. So, um, yeah, volatile weather, I would say. The volatility is one of the themes for today's session, so I like the play on words there, Bo. And just so that everyone is aware, we this this webcast is based on a white paper that we developed, the IDC developed uh, for Workday, but around investment management, digital transformation. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that as a as a bit of homework uh, and and read up on it in parallel. But let's get into it. There's a lot of ground to cover, as I said. And Bo, I'm going to come directly to you. Let's play a quick game here, Bo. Um, give me three words to describe what's going on in investment management at the moment. Right. Uh, let me see. So I think that would be um, market volatility. I'm going to go back to that word. That's a key word here. Um, ESG. Um, and then it would be this intermediation. Very cool. So, and I think that, that that's probably lined up here with these uh, with in the slide here. Do you want to give us a bit more detail on those three words? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, yeah. First, I mean market volatility. That's that's a fact. I mean, uh, during uh, two thousand twenty, uh, we saw at least in absolute uh, terms. Uh, bigger swings in, in, you know, in stock prices, for example, the NASDAQ composite, than what we saw during 2008. Um, you know, so large funds like, uh, you know, as mentioned in, in the picture, you know, uh, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth uh, Fund were hit very hard. Um, I mean, a lot of the stock markets, they uh, recovered, as we know, in second half of 2020. But this volatility is just adding to, to risk and, and complexity of, of, of the market. Um, and it's just a fact. I mean, we have geopolitical instability. We have a kind of increasing rate of, of natural disasters. We have a very common use of, of, of automated trading ro robots. And all of these things are kind of fueling uh, this volatility. And also, you know, issues like uh, with the GameStop uh, incident, where you have kind of new entrants in the stock market, like small activist traders that are acting in, in, in unison on, on Reddit and uh, really gaming these uh, trading algorithms and, and, and strategies, short selling uh, kind of strategies of the established um, investment management community and really causing massive losses to a kind of established uh, financial companies. So, and then, then finally there's this ESG. I think we've lost Bo, unfortunately. We've lost, okay. Yeah, we've lost Sam. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, it was actually my it's, hand that just uh, touched my microphone. So that was. What, what you can do, is if we're all happy with how, how it was going, if you just go back a minute or two and we can maybe stitch it together. Okay, sure. Uh, so what do I do? Um, I just uh, uh, begin somewhere, and then we yeah, start to pick it up on. Um, yeah, geopolitical instability or geopolitical instability. Yeah. All right. Right. 
Um, yeah, so uh, geopolitical instability, increasing rate of natural disasters, the common use of uh, automated trading robots, all of these things are, are kind of adding to, to the systemic kind of volatility. And we've also seen cases like GameStop, uh, where, where kind of new entrants uh, kind of acted in, in, in unison on, on Reddit, um, and they were able to game uh, kind of the algorithm algorithms and, and short selling strategies of the established uh, investment management uh, community and cause actually massive losses to, to certain investment management um, uh, um, companies. So, so that's, that's a fact uh, and, and uh, on the increase. And then we have the environment, environmental, social and, and, and governance funds, ESG, that is also on the rise. It has been for many years. And it's also putting pressure on investment management uh, companies because they have to offer new options and new kind of views on the market with those kind of env environmental and ethical kind of criteria uh, applied. So that all adds to the complexity. Yeah, very cool. So we've got volatility, disintermediation and ESG uh, as kind of key disruptions in the investment management space. So, but let's double click on disintermediation because I think that that's a, a big threat potentially for a lot of investment management firms. Do you want to give us a bit more detail on that? Though? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I mean, on the slide here, we see uh, Saxo uh, Bank, uh, the, the uh, CEO, um, and it's, it's a good case of uh, this intermediation, which has many expressions. And, uh, you know, the internet is here, the API, APIs are here, the financial exchanges and, and, and systems are increasingly linking up. And, and we've seen, for example, this uh, Denmark-based uh, Saxo Bank, it has uh, kind of disrupted the investment management uh, market by using technology. So it's a registered bank, but they're really acting as a technology company uh, offering this uh, Saxo Trader Go platform uh, to both the financial institutions, but also to, to the uh, investors directly. And uh, so they're really using technology to kind of disrupt and, and push, kind of punch above their weight. And uh, I mean, you can see from the quote that, that they're using automation, they're, in, they're integrating various exchanges uh, to to, to really scan the market and, and provide the best spot price is one of these uh, features that they offer uh, not available in the, in, the, in the market. So these types of approaches is really kind of democratizing uh, and making available to much bigger audience some of these uh, kind of advanced tools. And so the traditional providers of, of such investment services, they better watch out because margins are gonna get uh, squeezed. Yeah, but I think they're reacting as well, right? So if you look at Goldman, you look at BlackRock, they are making significant investments in technology platforms to try and build out their own capabilities uh, along those lines. So I suppose that, that leads into the next question, Bo, which is, you know, so what are the key business priorities for financial institutions to try and deal with this disruption based on what you're seeing? Yes, absolutely. And I mean, Phil, there's also an upside to this, right? Because as things get democratized, the, these markets are also expanding the, the addressable market. And I mean, guess what? Look, look at the, uh, we, we spoke to, um, to 131 uh, financial institutions at the end of uh, 2020. And what were the uh, kind of top business priority? Um, expansion through innovation and disruption. So, I mean, the financial institutions are keenly aware of these trends, of course. They know it's a question of disrupting or getting disrupted. Um, I mean, if we look at some of the other business, top business priorities, it's related to costs and, and productivity. Margins are becoming subject to pressure. And so it's all about uh, kind of optimizing and rethinking business processes. And then the third uh, highest prior business priority is, is that omnichannel customer engagement. And this is also happening in, in investment management. I mean, what happened in, in retail banking uh, five, 10 years ago is, is happening in investment management today. So uh, uh, clients want access via all sorts of different apps or uh, different options, self-service, phone, uh, third-party systems. They want that unified and, and coordinated experience. So, so these are kind of 
the top priorities. And and I would you know set the ball back to you, Phil. I mean, so so um, you know, how are these business priorities kind of translating into kind of concrete initiatives and change drivers for for the investment management firms? Sure. I mean, I, I really like the way you've passed the baton back to me there. <laughs> Yeah, I think just to you know, just to build on that, what we see are five key drivers for change for investment management firms. Um, and I'll talk through these just quickly. In terms of expanding into new markets and alternative products, you know, there is that new product element here, and, and the ES this fits into the, the disruption around ESG. So responding to market demands around requirements for funds that relate to environmental, social, and governance expectations. So if you look at BlackRock, as an example, they announced that they would double the number of ESG traded funds to, two, to 150 last year. Um, so that's a response, but it's not just ESG. Uh, you know, you also see a lot of the, the investment management firms setting up new types of funds, uh, credit income funds, as an example, which is pretty suitable in a recessionary environment. Uh, fixed income bonds as part of that, because obviously lower returns, but lower risk. Um, and then also the, some liquidity and solvency questions that are, are being set by the banks, right? So adjusting to, to deliver performance based on the new market expectations. Then you've got the accessing of new market segments. So that's exactly in line with what you were talking about in terms of that disintermediation. So going after some of the lower elements of the market, dealing with that, that retail investor uh, opportunity, but, but also at the same time, uh, the threat that it comes with that. Um, then you've got this focus on profitability because you know, in, the, in the same way you, that these investment management firms are going out to attract new business, they've also got to drive down efficiencies in the back office. So you saw particularly on the post-trade type of activities. So you're seeing a lot of outsourcing and shared services focus for post-trade activities coming through. Um, and then you've got this ongoing focus on compliance. I mean, the regulatory burden continues to grow on, on the investment management firms, KYC, AML, it, it just builds and builds and builds. And the level of detail required for regulatory reporting just increases on an ongoing basis. And then finally, it's this, this balancing between intimacy and scale for the relationship managers. So, you know, often for the investment management firms, the differentiator is the extent to which the relationship managers can drive the right set of conversations with customers. Um, so, but they want to provide the basis uh, for those relationship managers to have the right conversations. But also, because it's so high touch, how do they do that at scale? So that's the balance that they're trying to get right. So what we are seeing off the back of that is quite a dramatic change in terms of how these firms balance or scale those trading and settlement uh, capabilities with the back of, with back office functions like HR and finance, because those are critical to deliver the scale, to deliver the business model transformation that, that is required to build that digital transformation roadmap. So, that's uh, five key things, concrete things to your question, Bo. Uh, hopefully that helps to, to set the tone, but it's probably a good opportunity to bring uh, Viren into the discussion. So Viren, maybe building up on that focus on back office efficiencies and, and the link with HR and finance, you know, what are you hearing uh, from a workday standpoint in terms of some of the accounts that you're working with? Yeah, thanks, Phil. So look, what I'm seeing and hearing is that investment management organizations are now not only looking at resiliency when challenges arise, but also that agility to turn those challenges into opportunities. So I hear a lot about innovative business models and to this end, investment management organizations have been looking at digitizing and modernizing their operational front end systems, which you both have mentioned. And these organizations are realizing that to really get the benefits for the whole enterprise, they need to efficiently connect data and processes between the front office and that enterprise core of finance and HR. And, and if we dig into that, what I'm hearing, can we really summarize into these four points that we have here? So first of all, investment management firms want to optimize talent across the enterprise, not just for now, but also for looking ahead. So what's important for them here is 
workforce planning. It's about retaining and, and attracting the right talent. And it's about engaging with their workforce, especially now with remote working models. Also, they're looking to increase operational efficiency. Now, I hear a lot about inefficiencies in finance and HR function. They're also seeing disruption in the market from retail investors and potential disruption from other directions, as you've mentioned. So they need to make sure their business models can be changed very quickly. And they're looking at getting efficiency through process simplification via that technology simplification. And the third point here is that these organizations have realized the need to unlock more value from their existing operational and financial and employee data altogether. And they also need to be able to capture and report a new measures as challenges come across, come across. So it's important to note that investment management organizations need to also consider areas like compliance and of course the ESG, as you mentioned, data is key to this. So capturing new data as requirements change and then reporting it and then using that data for analysis. Now to do that efficiently and at speed is a fundamental requirement now. And it's a key thing that we're hearing from those accounts that I'm working on. And lastly, they need to manage, these organizations need to manage technology risk. Now I hear a lot about legacy systems that have worked well in the past, but now may not be relevant in supporting the business in this ever-changing world and, and of course industry. They're concerned that the existing systems they have do not provide data insight, agility, speed, and scalability, and they do not provide the timely insights that they need. They're also concerned that these legacy systems will not be able to make the most of machine learning and AI. And, and the big thing I'm hearing, and the big concern is cybersecurity. Cyber threats are on the increase, and there's high risk of these threats with legacy or outdated technology. So as part of this big theme here is an accelerated move to the cloud for finance and HR. Yeah, we were just actually talking about that earlier, Vernon, with Bo, in the sense that you know the, this this industry is very much on site and on premise historically. Right? That's been the mindset, and now with the changes that we've all experienced last year, it's had to move into a hybrid world, as you talked about up front in terms of that the, the new working model. But that cuts across into the technology space as well. So. The shift to the cloud, I think, is going to accelerate as a result of the events in, in, in 2020. Absolutely. Now, excellent. So great stuff. I hope so. That's that's a good intro. Uh, let's dig into the details now because you know we've talked about the context around what we see happening in investment management, uh, the, the key disruptors, the drivers for change, you know, what Workday is hearing in terms of, of your discussions. Let's dig into the details of the white paper. Um, so, Bo, I'm going to come across to you, and, and if you can just set the, the scene here with a little bit of background as to what we were trying to do with the white paper and how this could be relevant to anyone listening in the investment management space. Absolutely, Phil. Yeah. So, I mean, as you can see, um, what we have here is that kind of three horizon model that that IDC operates with to to kind of. Uh, um, uh, it, um, model industry transformation. So it's a three horizon model. Uh, horizon one is that kind of traditional approach with the added kind of incremental innovation. Horizon two is that kind of disruptive innovation entailing kind of a new way of doing business. And then uh, horizon three is that kind of emerging next generation business model, not common today, but kind of visible on the horizon. Um, each, each horizon then has a number of use cases attached to it that characterizes it. And so, I mean, yeah, as, as, as we see here, this, this three horizon model is, 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 is kind of applied here to the investment management uh, industry. So horizon one is really about kind of optimizing uh, performance by streamlining operations, kind of reducing costs, delivering kind of new revenue streams using technologies. And then we have horizon two that has these use cases that are kind of deployed in the midterm. And, and they are very much about kind of um, connected investment management value change. Uh, so this is where we see kind of increased collaboration uh, uh, to deliver uh, you know, uh, combined uh, use cases. So competitors, uh, kind of uh, connecting up where there's no kind of strategic differentiators. 
um, to deliver kind of new uh, services. And then Horizon 3 is taking this uh, kind of ecosystem approach to the next level. And we call that uh, Intelligent uh, Investment Consortium. So each of these horizons, uh, they require kind of certain digital uh, milestones to be met in HR and in finance. And so these are specified and called out in the white paper. So, uh, you know, the use cases, as you can see here, are, are very much related to, to customer facing uh, business operations, but they are indeed, as we just discussed before, also very connected and dependent on, on finance and HR processes. So if, for example, an investment management uh, firm would like to establish um, a data uh, marketplaces, for example, um, you know, uh, you need to establish a new organizational structure to, to, to support this, new reporting structures, new planning structures, and you might need new skills to be developed or contracted to support such uh, an initiative. Or for example, if, 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 if you um, consider the use case of real-time financial planning and you want to establish that, then that is linked to, to, to the financial uh, planning capabilities in the back office. So I'm not gonna go into kind of further detail here. Uh, the white paper details these kind of digital milestones in the back office that are connected to these um, use cases um, and I can just say we can strongly kind of recommend downloading and reading the white paper to get those insights into what's required at the back office level to keep track to, and, and to keep synced up with these kind of um, uh, horizons for the, for the investment management use cases. Cool stuff. Yeah, so I really like how you've kind of built out a couple of examples there, Bo. And that's, I suppose it's, it's a small window into the rest of the detail in, in the white paper. And I'm definitely gonna download it as a follow-up. So uh, weekend reading for me looking very, very promising. But Viren, I wanna zone in on uh, Horizon 1 and Horizon 2 in a bit more detail. And quite curious to learn around how you are working with customers in terms of that focus on in Horizon 1 and Horizon 2 at this stage. Yeah, sure. Well, then let's take it by each horizon. And, and if we talk about horizon one and performance optimization, and then we dig into HR. So for HR, when we talk about human performance optimization, our customers are using Workday to improve employee engagement to create an environment of trust. And they're continually planning their workforce for those changes in the market. Now, a good example of this uh, as a quote here is Aberdeen Asset Management. They have over 3,000 employees across 25 countries. Now they have called out that with Workday, they have improved the ability for managers to focus on more strategic initiatives. And in this quote, they highlight succession planning and talent management, which of course enables that performance optimization. And again, Horizon One, if we look at finance, now when we talk about that horizon, our customers are getting greater financial insights across their enterprise. They're unlocking more value from their data and they're able to do this because they don't have to deal with multiple silos of data and they don't have to reconstruct that data for reporting purposes. So the workday system is their source of truth where they can capture, easily capture new measures and where they can get financial and operational insight in real time and at speed. And uh, I'm going to call out here Man Group who have $124 billion of assets under management. It's very large. They've cut down on manual processes associated with reconstructing financial data. And now they're able to get real-time insights to make those timely management decisions. So something that I see in here that's, that a lot of asset managers are struggling to do in a really efficient way. And if we shift then onto Horizon 2, so for HR, Employees are able to keep their skills up to date with Workday and add value to the organization through some of our features like our skill based learning recommendations that enables that workforce agility that that Bo has just described. Now in finance uh, for Horizon 2, our investment management customers are able to plan and model for different scenarios and analyze the, the financial impact very quickly, which means they can plan, execute and analyze seamlessly and in real time. Now, th this is something that, that a lot of us would maybe associate with Horizon 1, but for Horizon 2, 
when we consider what we're doing around machine learning assistance, uh, it, it surfaces anomalies and trends that we're enabling that next level, really that intelligent performance modeling for Horizon 2. So I'm gonna call out AGF here, uh, a leading global asset manager, where they are scenario modeling and making those strategic course altering decisions and at speed, a big advantage, of course, in this changing world of asset management. So that, that's horizon one and two, but I, I just wanna add that these horizons shouldn't be step changes. If organizations have the right technology, that will help encompass these horizons effectively and efficiently. So with horizon three and the intelligent investment consortium, in order to get there, organizations need to be getting the right foundation in now. So customers I'm working with understand that, that they have the right technology in place to benefit from working with the wider ecosystem as that business model evolves into Horizon 3. Absolutely. So, yeah, the, the, the hands in the now, but the eyes in the future and, and being able to balance that. Um, and I think that that AGF example really links in nicely to the real-time financial planning use case that uh, Bo mentioned in, in the, the previous chart. So it comes together really nicely. Also, what's clear is that if you look at these examples, it's, it's different executives playing roles. Um, and, you know, this leads into the next element, which is about the roles that are emerging and what we call the digital dream team across these different executives that are having to execute on this digital transformation roadmap. And you might say, well, so what is the, what is the difference between the dream team and the traditional C-suite? Um, well, three key things. Number one, uh, every function becomes a technology function in line with what we talked about earlier in terms of the need for technology to underpin the business model. Number two, technology leadership is at the table and driving a lot of those discussions, but working very closely, increasingly with HR, with finance and some of the other executives to deliver the value. And thirdly, the CEO is increasingly at the, at the heart of this, so, so personally engaged, driving the broader digital transformation. But what I did want to do is zone in on three specific roles in a bit more detail and bring Bo back in to, to hear more about 2021 priorities for finance executives, HR executives, and technology executives in this digital dream team. Bo, do you want to talk us through that? Yeah, absolutely, Phil. And um, we actually did at IDC a, a survey across some of these um, uh, kind of key functions to get that view on what um, you know, one one part of the C-suite is looking at uh, differently from 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 the other part, and establish the kind of top priorities for these different roles, and um, and we did that at the end of 2020, and um, it kind of revealed that if we look at the uh, kind of tech leadership, the the the, the really the, the top priority is really uh, at kind of reorganizing the IT staff into more agile and you can say multidisciplinary teams with kind of broader skill sets um, to really enable that much faster reaction and much faster development pace. Uh, they're also very uh, concerned back to what we just mentioned uh, uh, you know, uh, a while ago on this big change that we saw in, in 2020 going from, from these kind of trading uh, desks and so on, uh, very on-premise to, to this hybrid um, workplace. How do you support that from an IT perspective? And then um, kind of speeding up the bringing to market and the development of, of new digital initiatives. So it's all about kind of supporting that speed. If we look at the finance side, it, it's uh, interestingly about data management. And again, uh, Phil, you know, all these functions are becoming much more IT savvy. Who would have thought that the CFO would be so concerned about that, you know, 10 years ago, but it, it's really about better analyzing and, 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 and reporting data. Uh, and then uh, also it's about, um, the, the second priority is about kind of enabling financial decision-making in the wider organization. So across the organizations, people are demanding um, financial data for their business unit and trying to benchmark what they're doing. And so it's a key kind of role for 2021 for the, the uh, financial directors to enable this self-service 
and democratize all these financial data and bring it out to the organization. And then finally, the CFOs are also looking to, to kind of better mitigate financial risk that we've seen a lot in 2020. So really better planning tools. And if we then go to the HR side, we've really seen that in 2020, HR has moved into kind of center of the organization because uh, 2020 has been very disruptive. People are now dispersed geographically. They are not sitting together in an office and a lot of concern also on health related to the pandemic, right? So the top concern is actually about kind of employee listening, employee recognition, employee engagement. How do you do that when everybody is, is at least partially sitting at home? Um, so that is top of, of mind uh, for, for 2020, uh, 2021. And then also, um, you know, recruiting. It is a top priority uh, for, 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 for HR. Um, new skill sets are needed. How do you recruit that top talent? And again, how do you do it in that situation where you just don't invite a candidate to the office, but everything is very dispersed? And then finally, that corporate culture. Again, we have a new scenario, hybrid working uh, environment. How do, you, how do you maintain or develop that, that company culture? Um, and, and, and so HR is really uh, also concerned about that. So those are kind of the, the big themes for, for 2021. Yeah, very interesting. And I, I think that, you know, that notion of, virtual HR, so uh, corporate culture in a virtual world, recruiting in a virtual world, driving employee engagement, it's all forcing a change in the approach and the mindset, and it goes beyond HR, right? it goes into the broader organization as well. Very cool. Yes. So uh, let's go back to you, Viren, as we start to head towards wrapping this up. You know, how do you bring this all together from a workday perspective to try and support your customers on the journey? Yeah, I think that this is a good point to talk about the Workday platform and what Bo's just described there is really a platform supports that alignment of those, of that dream team, if you like, and the functions of that dream team. So look, in a nutshell, Workday provides a single platform for finance, HR, planning, spend and analytics in the cloud, which you know is described in that diagram on the left there. And this allows organizations to plan, execute and analyze seamlessly. Now, I like to use the term frictionless platform because multiple systems and data silos cause friction for the smooth flow of data and process through the enterprise. And so I see Workday as a frictionless platform. And the benefits our customers realize from, from our platform, from that frictionless platform, are agility, its operational efficiency, and they're able to also fully unlock value from their data through powerful analytics. Uh, just to call out some names here, so we've got value asset, asset management is a great example of the benefit of that Workday platform. They started with HCM, then they added financials, then they added planning. They now have that agility to support their growth objectives. They can rewire processes in days. It's not weeks or months like they used to do before. And we have an HCM customer is BlackRock who have now added Workday's powerful Prism Analytics solution. So they can get that insight into their data that they need. So they're building out that platform. And I want to call out the challenger group who have HCM and they're now deploying financials, they're deploying planning, prism analytics, and also our new Workday Accounting Center solution. And they're really looking to get the full benefit out of this Workday platform. And that at the first level is technology simplification and operational efficiency. So now that these organizations are already on that journey that, that Bo has, has described here. And, and so just like Bo did before, Phil, I'm gonna throw this back at you, if I may. So it would be good to hear your key piece of advice for companies starting on this journey. Yeah, I like to be challenged in the same way that you are uh, working with the challenges, like uh, the, the group that you highlighted. So yeah, I think it's a good way to wrap up now in terms of thinking about what to do next. And the way to, the, from our perspective, the way to try and bring this together is actually to, to think about the use cases that we highlighted earlier, but in the context of that digital dream team and highlight how, for example, if we go back to data marketplaces, one of the use cases that Bo highlighted, 
how that is orchestrated across these key stakeholders. And it's not so much a tug of war, but it's a tug of value because it has to be delivering value for the organization, driving top or bottom line growth. And every single stakeholder is going to be engaged. Similarly, for that real-time financial planning, I mean, more driven by finance, clearly, but you know, the investment team, technology team, operations, they all need to be part of that. And it's a case of influencing, prioritizing, driving the adoption around these, these key use cases in order to deliver that value. So just to wrap up here, just to give you some perspectives on what you should be taking away from this, three key things off the back of everything we've covered in terms of that context, setting the roadmap, uh, thinking about the roles, and then thinking about how to map the use cases to the roles. The first thing is clearly that disruptive, the disruptive forces are driving change, but it's a case of using that as, as a basis to instigate a new approach. Uh, and that can be formulated in a digital roadmap. So you need to be strategic. You need to look at the future, think about the use case journey that takes you to that, that, that horizon three that Bo was talking about, but make sure that, that you're able to support that with the right structure, the right level of agility and insight to deliver the outcomes. And then finally, monitor, track, measure, but communicate outcomes internally, externally, so that you can use that to drive the next phase of investment. So a three-step process there just to, to take away. And as we've been highlighting, you know, it's all in the white paper, uh, lots to, 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 to explore in, in more detail. Um, but let me bring back my wonderful co-pilots back into the, the final section here. And I'm going to put the challenge back to you guys for the one sentence test, which is the, the final challenge for the day. Uh, one recommendation to leave our audience with, um, I'm going to go to you first, Varun. Let's see if you can do it in one sentence. Thanks, Phil. Um, okay, so what may have worked in the past with legacy systems is likely to be irrelevant now for this ever-changing world. So organizations need to get the right modern platform for their digital core to really drive that enterprise speed, agility, and greater insight to meet those horizons, uh, strategic horizons that you've outlined. That's my long sentence. There's a long one. Uh, modernize <laughs> to get to scale. Uh, along that digital roadmap. Very cool. All right, Bo, let's see if you can shorten it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try, uh, but it's hard. I understand Vera in there. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go back to, to those top priorities that we saw in the financial community, all about um, kind of growth via innovation and disruption. So, so my ending phrase will be gearing up the back office for accelerated innovation, and lower cost base. Along the same line, seeking out for the performance, but leverage the back office to do that. Very cool. And my recommendation is, is to download the white paper. So there you have it in front of you and get in touch with Viren if you want more details. Uh, I'd like to thank my co-pilots, the co-moderators for today, Viren Bo. Great job, really learned a lot. Uh, appreciate your insights and thank you for listening. Look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you very much. Hi there, and a very warm welcome to this IDC webcast sponsored by Workday, focusing on creating tomorrow's leaders uh, in the investment management space through holistic digital transformation. Uh, a bit of a mouthful, a lot of ground to cover, but it's going to be an exciting session. Uh, and I'm thrilled because I'm joined by two wonderful co-pilots for today's session. My name is Phil Carter. I'm the Chief Analyst for IDC in Europe. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I have got Virin Patel and Bo Lackegaard on the call with me, and they're going to be helping me drive us through the session. Let me go across to you, Virin, first. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, hi, Phil. I'm uh, Virin Patel. I'm Workday Strategic Industry Advisor for Financial Services in EMEA and APJ, and I'm sat here in uh, cold and damp uh, London, but great to be here on this uh, conversation. Excellent. Thanks for joining, Viren. Yeah, I was going to ask if the sun was out yet, but clearly not. Uh, it's still shining here in Munich, so all good to go. Uh, Bo, what about you in, in lovely Copenhagen? <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Uh, yeah, so um, lovely Copenhagen, but, but it's quite uh, stormy today. 
My name is uh, Bo Lekegaard. I'm uh, yeah, working in IDC, working very much in the software and enterprise applications uh, research. Yeah, happy to be here. Super. Very good. Thanks, guys. Uh, looking forward to a cool ride today. And we've got, this is just to inform everyone, this is off the back of a piece of work that we've done, this white paper, which you can see on the screen. And, and we'll be encouraging you to take a closer look at that uh, as, we go, as we go through the session. Um, let me jump straight into it, though, with uh, Bo. I'm going to come to you. Let's play a bit of a game here, Bo, to kick things off. Give me three words to describe what's going on in the investment management industry right now from an IDC perspective. Right. Um, so I think that would be kind of uh, market volatility. It would be um, ESG and it would be uh, disintermediation. Those would be my three words. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a cheat there because market volatility <laughs> and ESG is actually an acronym. Anyway, but give us more detail. But I, th I think that you whet our appetites. Give us more detail. All right. Yeah, I mean, market volatility, that's a, a fact, uh, something that we saw very strongly during 2021. I mean, you can see there an example on the slide here with uh, Norway's uh, sovereign wealth fund that was really hit hard in first half. We did see uh, all of the financial markets kind of recover towards the end of the first half and especially during second half, but it did kind of highlight that huge volatility and, and the swings and those especially short-term uh, risks and headaches that it creates for the investment management community. And it is something that we expect to continue with geopolitical instability and and you know, increasing rate of natural disasters and the, the kind of automated trading robots and a lot of things contributing to that. We did see that GameStop um, incident where a kind of uh, new entrants on the stock, stock markets like uh, small activist uh, traders acting in unison really kind of gamed the, the established uh, investment community and their um, you know, short selling strategies and really cost big losses to the uh, established vendors. So, so that's one, one thing. And then the, the, the acronym there that you mentioned, ESG, the envir environmental and, and social and, and, and governance uh, uh, funds, they, have, they are on the rise. Uh, they're expected to be even stronger on the rise in, in, in this year, 2021. And they have been for, for, for many years. And it's, it's just adding to that kind of complexity uh, in the investment management uh, uh, community because it's a new way of, 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 of looking at a kind of stock performance and new criteria for investment. So just adding to that complexity. Yeah, hundreds of new dimensions and criteria being applied, right? Absolutely. New ESG funds. But I want to double click on uh, this disintermediation word that you highlighted, uh, because I, yeah, I think that is a, a very big threat uh, to the investment management firms out there. Give us a bit more detail on that one, Bo. Yeah, I mean, uh, on this slide here, uh, you see... Um, Saxo Bank and, and, and that kind of trading, trading platform, Saxo uh, Trader Go that they have uh, developed. And I mean, this intermediation has many expressions, right? The internet is here, the APIs are here, uh, you know, and, and financial exchanges and, and financial systems are just increasingly getting linked up. And it's, it's, it's just a market ripe for, for disruption. And what uh, this, uh, relatively small bank did was it really funneled all the money into technology and really acted like a technology company and provided this platform to both kind of financial institutions and investors. And they really used this technology to kind of disrupt uh, established players and really punch above their weight. And um, so, so basically what we can see here is that um, investment management tools and capabilities are becoming democratized. They're becoming available to a much wider audience and the kind of traditional providers of investment management services, they better watch out because margins are, are gonna get squeezed. 
Yeah, um, but there, there is that upside, right? Uh, so that needs to be taken into account as well. But so what is this, how does this translate into kind of the key business priorities for the financial sector moving into 2021, Bo? Right. And you're right about the upside. I mean, as, as things are becoming democratized, new segments are opening up. So it's also an opportunity for, for the investment management commu uh, community to really reach out into new segments and have a, a, a wider addressable market. But I mean, looking at, at, at these uh, top priorities, guess what? I mean, we at the end of 2020, um, we spoke to uh, 131 financial institutions. And what was the top business priority? Expansion through innovation and disruption. I mean, so the, the financial institutions, they're very keenly aware of these disruptive trends. They know that it's a question of, of disrupting or getting disrupted. Um, in terms of the second uh, business priority, it's, it's very much related to costs and productivity. Margins are getting squeezed. So it's really about optimizing and rethinking business processes. And then the third highest priority is omnichannel uh, customer engagement. I mean, what happened in retail banking 10, uh, five, 10 years ago um, is happening to, in investment management today. So the, these clients, they want access via multiple different devices. Uh, they want uh, uh, kind of integrated um, uh, experiences also uh, via third-party systems. So um, that omnichannel is, 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 is also a major priority today. So, so with that, uh, these things going on, I'll pass the, the, the ball back to you, Phil. I mean, we've seen these business priorities, but how do they translate uh, back into kind of concrete initiatives and change drivers in the investment management uh, industry? For sure. Yeah, I, I do like the way you just uh, very seamlessly pass the baton back to me there, Bo. But you want concrete uh, examples here, concrete uh, drivers for change. Is that right? That's right. Okay. I'll give my best shot. So, I mean, there's five key things that we see happening here. On the one hand, there is this expansion into new markets with alternative products. The ESG example that you highlighted is a good one. BlackRock doubling the number of ESG funds through to 150 this year. That's that's the plan. But it's not just ESG, it's multi-asset funds, it's credit income funds, a range of different products. Then you've got the new segments. So that's the disintermediation piece. So responding to that by going after the new segments. MA, we expect MA to ramp up in 2021 as a result of that. You've got unlock unlocking efficiencies in the back office, going after profit particularly for post-trade activities. So you're seeing outsourcing and, and uh, shared services capabilities being brought in to drive profitability linked to back office inefficiencies. The ongoing regulatory burden, which never goes away, AML, KYC, the, the regulations that, that these investment management firms have to deal with. And then finally, this balance between scale and intimacy for the relationship managers, making sure they have the capabilities at their fingertips in that high touch model uh, but scaling that across the board. So some really interesting drivers for change. I uh, hope those are, are concrete enough for you, Bo. But I think the key thing that we think we'd like to explore in a bit more detail in this session is the impact that these changes have on the, the key functions like HR and finance, technology, the, the more traditional business functions as opposed to the front office uh, facing business functions. So. Let me bring Viren, I think it's a good opportunity uh, to, to bring Viren, particularly in the context of, of that topic. So Viren, how do you see this playing out in some of the accounts that you're working with in terms of unlocking some of the back office uh, efficiencies and becoming more agile moving forward? Yeah, look, I, I hear a lot about innovative business models, especially as uh, Bo has just described in response to that. And to this end, uh, I hear investment management organizations have been looking at digitizing and modernizing their operational front end systems. But these organizations are increasingly realizing that to really get benefits for the whole enterprise, they need to efficiently connect data and processes between that front office and the enterprise core of finance and HR. So if we dig into that just a little bit more, what I'm hearing, can we summarize really into these four points you see here? So first of all, investment management firms want to optimize talent across the enterprise. 
not just for now, but also for looking ahead. So what's important for them here is workforce planning, it's, retra it's retaining rather and attracting the right talent. And it's about engaging their workforce, especially now with remote working models. Uh, secondly, they're also looking to increase operational efficiency. I hear a lot about inefficiencies in finance and HR functions. And these organizations are looking at getting efficiency through process simplification via technology simplification. Uh, moving on, these organizations have realized the need to unlock more value from their existing operational and financial and employee data together. And they also need to be able to capture and report the new measures. And so data is key here, capturing new data as requirements change and then reporting it and then using that data for analysis. Now to do that efficiently and at speed is a fundamental requirement in this day and age. And lastly, uh, that last point, they need to manage technology risk. Now I hear a lot about legacy systems that have worked well in the past, but now may not be relevant in supporting the business in this ever changing world and industry. The concern that the existing systems they have do not pro provide that data insight, that agility, that speed, that, that scalability, and they do not provide the timely insights that they need. So these organizations are concerned that these legacy systems will not be able to make the most of uh, things like machine learning and AI. And a big concern for them is cybersecurity. Cyber threats are on the increase. We hear that a lot in the news and there's a high risk of these threats with legacy or outdated technology. And as part of this big theme here is an accelerated move to the cloud for both finance and HR. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Very nice. We were talking about it earlier in the context of the shift to hybrid workplaces. So on-site was the model in investment management. So in the office and, and on-premise uh, from a technology standpoint. And I think we're moving to a work anywhere world and, and clearly moving to the cloud to support that. So I think that comes together to deal with some of the, the things that you're hearing from, from clients. So that's, that's a good way of setting us up uh, for the substance of the session, which is all about going into the white paper in a bit more detail. Um, and so, Bo, given the fact that you, you wrote most of this white paper, do you want to tell us a little bit about how we set it up, what we were trying to do to help investment management organizations in terms of building their digital roadmaps? Absolutely, Phil. I mean, uh, you know that IDC operates with that kind of three horizon model to analyze industry uh, transformation. So we applied that in the white paper. And I mean, just to look at the model, horizon one, that's that kind of uh, traditional approach with added kind of incremental innovation. And then you have horizon two, which is the more kind of disruptive innovation, uh, the, the new way, uh, kind of implying new way of doing business. And then you have horizon, horizon three, which is that kind of next generation business model, which is kind of visible on the horizon, not common really today, but it, we know it's coming. So that's typically the framework that we use. Each horizon has use cases attached to it as very concrete use cases. So here we can look at it from, you know, in the context of, of the investment management industry, you can see the use cases there and you can see the three horizons. Horizon one being about kind of optimizing performance, streamlining operations, reducing costs, delivering new kind of revenue, revenue streams using technology, but in an incremental fashion. And then you have uh, the, the horizon two, which is that kind of more connected investment, uh, investment uh, management value chain, where this is kind of a midterm thing where we see um, kind of collaboration between competitors in the areas where they're, they're not kind of strategic differentiators between them. Um, and then finally, Horizon 3, which is that kind of business model transformation, uh, taking, to, taking kind of this ecosystem approach to the next level. So it's really kind of personalized investment products. And, and, um, and, and that's what we call uh, kind of this intelligent uh, investment consortium. So each of these uh, kind of horizons, they, they do require certain digital milestones going back to what Viren said about this connection between the, the uh, kind of back office um, HR and, and, and finance functions and these kind of operational 
uh, initiatives. And they, these um, kind of digital milestones are specified in, uh, in the white paper uh, very concretely. So for example, if you take a use case, um, um, uh, for example, uh, like, um, uh, uh, for example, building that kind of uh, data, data marketplace, um, it, you will need kind of an agile way to establish kind of a new kind of organizational structure for that. You will need kind of a new reporting structure. You will need a new planning structure. You'll need new skill sets perhaps to develop, uh, to develop internally or to contract to uh, kind of implement that sort of initiative. So, so there's a lot of, of, of link there. Uh, I mean, if we consider another uh, use case like the real-time financial planning, you want to establish that there is like a clear link to the uh, kind of financial planning capabilities in the back office. So we're not gonna go into complete detail here, but, but the white paper does detail these digital milestones in HR, in finance, for those kind of steps through the, the, the three horizons. Yeah, I really like how you've kind of built out some examples of the use cases, linked that to the underlying HR and financial processes to support that. But I think let's go into this in a bit more detail with some examples. Uh, so it'd be great to get your perspective, Verena, as to how you're working with specific investment management firms with a focus on horizon one and two, because I think that's in the short and medium term uh, where people are trying to ask some questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, if I take those two horizons separately, first of all, and then let's look at horizon one and, and performance optimization. So for HR, when we talk about human performance optimization, our customers are using Workday to improve employee engagement, to create that environment of trust. And they're continually planning their workforce for those changes in the market. And a good example of this is Aberdeen Asset Management. They have over 3,000 employees across 25 countries. They have called out that with Workday, they have improved the ability for managers to focus on more strategic initiatives. And in this quote you see here, they highlight succession planning and talent management, which of course enables that performance optimization that's outlined for Horizon One. And for finance, when we talk about Horizon One, our customers are getting greater financial insight across their enterprise. They're unlocking more value from their data. And they're able to do this because they don't have to deal with those multiple silos of data. And they don't have to reconstruct that data for reporting purposes. So the Workday system is their source of truth where they can easily capture new measures, where they can get financial and operational insight in real time and importantly at speed. Now, I wanna call out Man Group who have over $124 billion of assets under management. They've cut down on manual processes associated with reconstructing financial data and are now able to get real-time insights to make timely management decisions. Something that many asset managers are really struggling to do in, a, in an efficient way. Now, let's uh, move to Horizon 2. So for HR, employees are able to keep their skills up to date with Workday and add value to the organization through some of the features that we have, like our skill-based learning recommendations that enables that workforce agility that, that you just described. And in finance, our investment management customers are able to plan and model for different scenarios and analyze the financial impact very quickly. Again, as, as Bo has just described, which means that they can plan, execute, and analyze seamlessly in real time. Now, this is something that some of us here would maybe associate with, with Horizon 1, but for Horizon 2, when we consider what we're doing around machine learning assistance to surface anomalies and trends, then we're enabling that next level, i.e. that intelligent performance modeling. And, and here I want to call out um, AGF, a leading global asset manager, where they are scenario modeling, making strategic course, altering decisions at speed. Now that's a big advantage in this changing world, ever-changing world of asset management. But I just wanna add that these horizons shouldn't be step changes. The right technology will help encompass these horizons effectively and efficiently. So with Horizon 3 and that intelligent investment consortium, in order to get there, organizations really need to be getting the right foundation in now. So customers I'm working with understand this and they have the right technology in place to benefit from working with the wider ecosystem as that business model evolves. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and I really like how those examples, particularly man and AGF, they, they link back to some of those uh, financial, for example, the financial, real-time financial planning uh, as, as examples. So the use cases are, 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 are very clear to see. That's great. So, um, but as you, I think if you're looking at this, you can see the different roles that, that are coming up in these discussions. Uh, and actually that links nicely to the people <laughs> who need to execute on this. So the, the digital dream team, the future C-suite uh, as, as we like to, to call it. So Bo, I'm gonna call you back in and to give us a perspective on three key roles in the context of that digital dream team, given the link between the finance and HR processes to those digital use cases. Do you wanna talk us through uh, the priorities for 2021 for those key roles based on our research? Absolutely, Phil. Uh, we, we did a survey in IDC um, towards the end of, of 2020, and, and we, we did actually do that. We, we did uh, specifically interview, uh, you know, uh, different members of the C-suite across uh, many hundreds uh, companies at the end of, of 2020 to understand what are the different kind of uh, uh, priorities uh, for, for these different roles uh, in the in the C-suite. And uh, what we found was that on, on the technology leadership side, the, the, the top priority is really to reorganize um, IT staff into uh, more agile, you can call it multidisciplinary teams. So teams with broader skill sets connecting both development and operations they were also, uh, the IT managers were, were also very concerned with supporting this kind of emerging hybrid work environment that we've talked about already. So that's a big agenda item for IT to support that from an IT perspective. And then finally, to uh, kind of feed into this disruption and innovation and, and quickly develop and bring to market a new digital uh, initiative. So those are the kind of top priorities on the IT side. If we go to the CFO side to finance department, the top one was really about data management, uh, becoming better at, at analyzing and reporting uh, uh, data. So that's interesting. I mean, who would have thought 10 years ago that the CFOs would be so kind of concerned about some of the IT aspects of, of, of financial data uh, but that's the case today in, for, for 2021. It's also uh, the second priority was, is very much about kind of enabling the financial decision-making in the wider organization. So today in, in the organizations, a lot of department level uh, managers are, are really looking at financial data. And so it's a key priority for CFOs to enable that decentral use of, of finance data and, and support that decentral deci financial decision making. Uh, and that takes technology. And then finally, um, the CFOs are very concerned on, on mitigating financial risk. We did see a lot of disruption in 2020. So that's a top priority for 2021. And then on the HR side, um, really what we saw was, uh, uh, you know, the, the HR decision makers, the CHROs are really at the forefront of the enterprise now uh, because the, the pandemic has impacted both employee health, but also created these very dispersed companies that used to be together in, in offices. And, and so the top concern or the top priority is really to be better and it, it develop capabilities in employee listening, employee engagement, employee recognition in this hybrid world. How do you feel uh, employees uh, feeling part of the team, feeling valued and listened to? Big challenge for, 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 for companies and, and something to look at for 2021. Um, recruiting is also a top priority. Um, there's a fight for talent, as, as we can see, uh, for example, investment management companies are launching new initiatives. How do you find the correct talent for that? And how do you do that in a world where the applicant doesn't walk into the office, but needs to be kind of interviewed remotely and so on? Uh, so that is another thing. And then finally, company culture. How do you keep working with that, evolving that in this hybrid, a little bit dispersed scenario how do you do that? 
another kind of top priority for, for HR. Yeah, what's really interesting as you look at this is how a lot of these priorities actually cut across multiple roles. So it's not just about HR delivering this improved corporate culture. Everyone else has to, to be on board to, to be able to do that. So, yeah, I think uh, that, that's a good overview. Thanks very much, Bo. Let's let's go back to you, Viren, uh, and get a, a final perspective on you and on how Workday is bringing this all together for, for your customers. Yeah, I just want to explain a little about the Workday platform, and that really uh, aligns to what Bo is just saying there, is Workday platform bringing together those digital roles and those functions together. So on the diagram you have on the left there, it shows what Workday is. It's a single platform for finance, HR planning, spend, and analytics in the cloud. And that allows organizations to plan, execute, and analyze seamlessly. Now, I use this term quite frequently, which is a fric frictionless platform. And um, I use that term because multiple systems and data silos cause friction for the smooth flow of data and processes around the enterprise. So I see Workday as a frictionless platform. And the benefits our customers realize from this platform or this frictionless platform are agility, it's operational efficiency, and they're able to fully unlock value from their data through powerful analytics. Now, Valiasni Asset Management is a good example of the benefit of that Workday platform. They started with HCM, then they added financial, then they added planning, and they now have that agility to support their growth objectives. They can rewire processes in days, it's not weeks, it's not months. We have an HCM customer, BlackRock, who have now added Workday's powerful Prism Analytics solution, so they can get that insight into their data that they need, so they're building out that, that platform. And I want to call out the challenger group who have HCM currently and are now deploying financials, planning, prism analytics, and they're also deploying a new accounting center solution. So they're really looking to get the full benefit out of that Workday platform. And that at the first, very first level is technology simplification and it's operational efficiency. So, but these organizations are already on that journey that, that both of you have described and uh, more indeed that Bo had described on that previous slide. And so Phil, I wanna throw this back at you, if I may. Um, it'd be good to hear your key piece of advice for companies that are starting out on this journey. Yeah, thanks Varun. I think we've covered a lot of ground, uh, a lot of inspiring stuff, talking about you know, the, the disruptions uh, in, in this investment management space, how organizations are building that new digital roadmap supported by HR and finance, great insights from, from a workday standpoint in terms of how you're working with your customers. In terms of what we would recommend for organizations to start thinking about is to orchestrate value, a tug of value across this digital dream team linked to those use cases. So if you take that data marketplace use case that Bo talked about earlier, you can see it's not driven by one executive in the digital dream team. It's orchestrated across all of these stakeholders in a seamless fashion uh, and it might lean towards one side versus another so this the data marketplaces might be driven more by sales and chief investment officers whereas the real-time financial planning is clearly more financial and and uh, investment um, uh, capability as driven by those stakeholders but the point is that it's everyone leaning in and providing an input in terms of this tug of value so that's the the way of trying to bring it all together in terms of the use cases and the underlying capabilities. Three key things to think about as you move forward with your the next phase of your transformation. First of all, leverage that disruption to instigate the need to move because that clearly is going to have to happen for all investment management firms moving into 2021. Be strategic in terms of defining that roadmap, identify and prioritize the use cases that are meaningful for you, but then make sure that you have everyone on the journey with you, HR, finance, technology, all of the key leaders that are going to have to drive that to scale, and then track that, monitor it, measure it, and communicate it on an ongoing basis. These are the key things just to, to think about, to take away from the session, to try and bring it all together. Um, and I suppose we do have one minute left to get the final recommendations from the, the wonderful uh, panel today. So the, the challenge here as we go away is to get a one sentence recommendation from each of, of the different panelists. I'll, I'll have my say as well. Viren, uh, I'll start with you. Okay, I'll try to keep it as a short sentence. I'll try. So 
what may have worked in the past with legacy systems is likely to be irrelevant now for this ever-changing world. So organizations need to get the right modern platform for their digital core to meet the strategic horizons that have been outlined here. Hashtag modernize to scale. Very good. Uh, Bo, across to you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, yeah, so um, I want to connect back to, to, to that uh, kind of fi uh, financial um, uh, sector top priority that we saw, which was all about growth via innovation and disruption. So my final sentence is going to be gearing up the back office for accelerated innovation and lower cost base. Hashtag accelerated innovation. Very cool. Great job. So, and my recommendation is download the white paper. If there's one thing that you're going to do or get hold of Virin, uh, if, you, if you want more details, I'm sure he's got a lot more information to, to offer. Um, so great job, guys. Thank you so much for your insights. I really learned a lot today. Um, and thank you to all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.